It is my honor to tee up this panel and the important question behind it. Barack Obama drew a red line against the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Donald Trump chose to militarily defend it. Notwithstanding that tactical difference, both presidents have defined U.S. vital national interest in Syria in terms of a war against the Islamic State, not a war against the Assad regime. The Obama administration sought to negotiate Assad's removal. The interventions by Iran and Russia frustrated that effort. The recent meeting between Presidents Trump and Putin hint at a strategy to gradually stabilize Syria, ceasefire by ceasefire, but it does not appear that we are close to resolving the most complex conflict in recent memory. The American approach to Syria has been shaped by the limited foreign policy mandates that emerged from both the 2008 and 2016 campaigns. Obama was elected to unwind America's wars. Trump promised to make America great again. Both elections reflected the desire of the American people for a less interventionist foreign policy, or at least through overt means involving large numbers of American forces. They want their government to solve more problems in middle America than in the Middle East. While most of us believe that the U.S. government can do both, the current domestic political dynamic with its renewed fears of slippery slopes and renewed skepticism of searches for foreign monsters to destroy will certainly influence the debate over what must be done in Syria and what can be done at an acceptable cost. Moderating this panel is Tobin Harshaw, the national security editor of Bloomberg View, the opinion section of Bloomberg News. He writes editorials and columns on a wide range of military and intelligence issues. He previously spent two decades at the New York Times editorial pages, serving as deputy op-ed editor, letters editor, and author of the online column, The Opinionator. Tobin, take it away. Thanks a lot, PJ. Uh, and of course, thanks to Walter and Clark and the Aspen Institute uh, for putting on this wonderful thing every year, uh, as well as a posthumous thanks to Walter Pepke for spending his millions here, as opposed to, uh, I guess otherwise, we'd be in a cardboard factory in Chicago. Um, weeks ago, when Clark told me the title of the panel, it set up red flags. Um, the strike it refers to, obviously, is the strike on the Syrian airfield that President Trump said was in retaliation for the <laughs> chemical weapons attack by the Assad regime. Um, I told Clark I was concerned that a lot could happen between then and now. Um, what if you know there were many strikes since then? What if there were thousands of U.S. troops uh, pacifying the Euphrates Valley? Um, what if ISIS had been wiped out? What if we had cut a peace deal uh, with Iran and, and Russia? What if Assad had fallen from power? Um, Clark told me to relax, and uh, I have to agree that uh, maybe for the first time in my life, I can be fairly accused of being overly optimistic. <laughs> um, so I think most observers would say that relatively little has changed. Um, Assad's not only standing, but his Russian-backed troops have made gains against uh, the rebel forces. Uh, Iran and uh, its puppets from Hezbollah have made gains of their own. Uh, the US has shown a little bit more moxie, uh, shooting down a Syrian fighter. Um, but I don't think anyone thinks that's really changed the calculus um, of the war. And uh, more recently, uh, we reached a ceasefire. Putin and, and the president did on the sidelines of the G20 to create uh, a ceasefire zone uh, in the southwest of the country, um, which may be great, but it's kind of small potatoes in a war that's killed more than half a million people and displaced millions of others. Um, so is it fair to say that relatively little has changed? Um, to answer that question, we have these four people who are not only experts, uh, but also passionate about the Syrian civil war. Uh, they come from very different walks of life. Uh, we will start with uh, Representative Jane Harmon, and of all the people uh, in Aspen who need no introduction, she probably needs it less than anyone else. Um, she served nine terms in Congress, uh, representing the 36th District of California. 
uh, where those of you who are in the aerospace industry may have been represented by her. Uh, she served on what we in this room call the big three committees, uh, armed services, intelligence, and homeland security. Um, she's now the president and CEO of the Wilson Center in Washington. So play your cards right. Maybe she has a sweet gig for you. Uh, and as many of us found out last night, she throws a hell of a party. Uh, next to her is Stuart Jones. And Stuart is, let me get this right, the acting assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs. Uh, before that, he was the US ambassador to Iraq and to Jordan. Um, and now he's one of the old hands at the State Department trying to keep things going, uh, underfunded and underappreciated as they are in an administration that uh, isn't all that fond of diplomacy. Uh, your, next your words, to, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> next is, to see, is Dina Kawar, who since uh, the beginning of the year has been the ambassador of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the US. Um, it's appropriate because she was educated here at Mills College, Columbia University, and Harvard. Um, previously, she uh, was the Jordanian representative to the United Nations and was the first woman to preside over the Security Council. Uh, last is Andrew Tabler, the Martin J. Gross Fellow in Arab Politics at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, Andrew doesn't only write about the Middle East, he's lived it. He spent many years, uh, many time, much time, in Syria under the Assad dynasty. Um, he's where he uh, co-founded Syria Today, which was Syria's uh, first English language independent publication. So thank you all for being here. Let's get down to it. Uh, Representative Harmon, going back to the title of the panel, um, many people felt that Barack Obama's unwillingness to uh, act on the red line he had drawn, weakened the US not only in Syria, not only in the Middle East, but hurt our standing globally. Some people feel that the strike that we're here to talk about redeemed the US in some ways. Do you agree with that assessment? Um, yes and yes, but I want to explain after I say one thing. I served in Congress for a long time, as everybody knows. A giant there, or two giants there, were uh, Ted Kennedy and John McCain. And uh, the loss of Ted Kennedy to glioblastoma, glioblastoma was, is still felt. And this diagnosis for John McCain is just devastating to anybody who thinks we need bolder leadership in the United States Congress. And I assume all of you think we need bolder leadership in the United States Congress. <laughs> and I really just don't know who comes after McCain. I've tried to think about it. And, you know, again, as someone who's traveled the world with him and, and still sees him every year at the Munich Security Conference, which some of you attend, and at the Halifax Security Conference and elsewhere, he has generated, he has educated generations of members in foreign policy. And uh, contrary to what uh, PJ said, I do think uh, people do and should care about foreign policy. So Syria. Uh, back in the day, I was on an intelligence committee trip to Damascus, and I met with Bashar. Yes, I did, in a small group. And we all thought at the time, when he came to power, that he was still under the influence of his father, Hafez's advisors, but they would go away, and he would be a modern leader, remember, educated as an optometrist in London, married, uh, 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 I guess she's Syrian, but, but basically British-raised woman and all things would be different. And his behavior in that meeting was fairly uh, OK, although he leaned over to me and said, with his long neck, as the only woman in the room, Dina, I have nothing against Jews. It's just Zionists that we don't like. And I restrained myself from raising my hand and saying, well, maybe I'm a Zionist, too, thinking of Sidney Harmon screaming at me, don't go there. What's wrong with you? So I kept my mouth shut, but it was creepy. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Obama made a major mistake by not following through on the red line. If he didn't want to follow through, he shouldn't have had a red line. Mm -hmm. But I think your characterization is right. We lost prestige everywhere. And John Kerry had just been out you know, 10 minutes before saying we were going to do it. Uh, I think it was a big mistake. I'm not calling it a strategic mistake, because I don't know that we had a strategy. I think Trump following through uh, after there was clear evidence of a chemical attack, did the right thing. But again, I don't see what the evidence of a strategy is. 
And I think uh, we lack a strategy in Syria. We lack a strategy in the greater Middle East. I'm hoping that uh, what Tom Bossert just said uh, will happen, and a new CT document will come out, and there will be a strategy, and it will be good. But my last comment is Congress needs to play, too. We haven't authorized the use of military force beyond, basically, Afghanistan uh, and, and our adventure in Iraq uh, since 2002. This is 2017, folks, and Congress is not in the game, which means the public is not in the game. And uh, kudos to Jeff Flake and Tim Kaine, who have introduced a new AUMF bill, and we're at the Wilson Center just last week to defend it. Maybe it will get traction. And they, uh, I believe Congress the other day stripped the measure in the NDAA, right, that was going to call for killing the, the 2001 AUMF? Oh, stripped it. The Barbara Lee measure. The Barbara, Barbara Lee, Lee measure. was the only member of Congress, she's from uh, Berkeley, who voted against the AUMF in 2001, the AUMF, to authorize us to go after those who attacked us on 9-11. I voted for it enthusiastically and think it was the right thing to do. But Nobody who voted for it ever thought it would be in place 16 years later and apply to every action we take in the Middle East. Stuart, you, uh, you've been on the changeover between the two administrations. Um, so you lived through the red line, you've lived through the strike. Um, some people feel that this is a dramatic rethinking of American strategy. Others feel that Trump is just Obama approach with a little more muscle. What do you think? Well, I think that the April 4th attacks, the, C the chemical attacks on Khan Sheikh Khun represented a significant measure by the Syrian regime early in the Trump administration. Um, and it, 74 people killed, over 500 people injured. It was the worst attack since the Eastern Ghouta attacks back in 2013 when up to 1,300 people were killed. So clearly something needed to be done. Uh, president's action was swift, it was direct, and mm -hmm. you know, three months, four months later, you don't hear any criticism of that strike. Um, I think it did refocus the attention of the parties. Again, three months later now, we have brokered a ceasefire agreement in, in the southwestern quadrant of Syria with the cooperation of Russia and the Jordanians. So, um, so clearly, I think, you know, look, you know, if we look at where we were then and where we are now, this is not a bad thing and very likely a very good thing. Uh, I think, you know, in the context of Syria, we've got a strategy. We have a strategy first to defeat I ISIS. Mm -hmm. um, that is going well. You know, not only has ISIS collapsed in Mosul, but it's now on the verge of collapsing in, in uh, Raqqa. It's not over. Clearly, ISIS is going to continue to pose a threat to both Iraq and Syria. But the tremendous progress we've seen over the last two years in defeating ISIS is impressive. And that's something that we can, that we can use and bank on. The second part of the strategy is to create these zones of ceasefires, not to break up Syria. We're committed to the uh, uh, territorial integrity of Syria, but to create areas where we can deliver humanitarian assistance, where people can start to leave, lead normal lives, and where they can, we can deliver, um, and where you know, then they could start to think about creating the basis for a political process as the Security Council resolutions call for. So is this of a piece with the, uh, the deal that the Turks, the Iranians, and the Russians tried to come up with to create sort of spheres of influence? Or do we, are we looking at a different approach? So, it's, you know, um, like Tom said earlier, I mean, the, the definitions and the vocabulary are very important. So what the Astana process, which is the Turkey, Russia, Iran uh, sort of arrangement is, they talk about certain de-escalation areas and um, when they announced those de-escalation areas in May, something good happened. We started seeing much less violence in those areas. So, OK, we don't want to interfere with that. We want to encourage that. But that's quite different from the ceasefire that we have uh, engineered with the leadership of Jordan and also with the cooperation of the Russians. So um, the idea is to create, again, areas where there's no fighting, where people can get back to normal life, where we can get the humanitarian assistance, and then creating the basis, possibly over time, for a political, uh, for a political solution. Uh, Dina, let's go back to, uh, to the red line and then the Trump strike. Uh, what was the view in the neighborhood? Well, OK, everybody, we all know that we were all disappointed because it, it did show um, that the administration had to act. However, people forget that after this story, 
the UN started with the uh, destruction of all chemical weapons, and the program has been very successful, and the Security Council followed through out, throughout on this program. So it has managed to remove all chemical weapons within the Syrian regime. Now, there's always talk that some is hidden, we don't know where, but in general, it has been a successful uh, program. One should not forget that part. Um, another thing I wanted to say that since seven years, the issue has been, do we get rid of the regime or do we get rid of ISIS? And people have to remember the historic from day one till now, is that two years ago, Syria almost had 70% of its territory occupied by ISIS. And uh, at that stage, everybody panicked, including the United States, including Europe, including all the Arab countries, of course, because we're involved. And the solution was to concentrate on that. Now, if we, we need to concentrate on that, and Jordan has been in the forefront in fighting uh, terrorism and in its uh, coalition. However, comes a point where you know, there's a balancing that has to be done. So we're, we keep saying and we keep insisting that the political process and the Geneva process should not be forgotten uh, along the line. So there is the Astana security, there is the, uh, the Geneva, and now, with the uh, zone that we created. It's important that it works. It's very important. Uh, and Andrew, last, uh, Representative Harmon gave us her reading of Bashar al-Assad. Um, why don't you give us yours? How did he, did he expect Obama to back down, do you think? And do you think he sees Trump as a bigger threat? I think he does see President Trump as a bigger threat um, because of the strike. Um, and I think that uh, the regime and, and I think to a certain extent the, the Iranians and the Russians uh, might have been testing uh, mm -hmm. President Trump on this for a variety of reasons. Um, I think that uh, President Assad didn't know where President Obama fully stood. Uh, he thought when he drew the red line that it would be very hard to back away from it, as was for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of di talking about uh, Bashar himself and dealing with him, my own interaction is I would, I, I like the creepy word. Um, uh, he's always been a very strange figure, and this is where he's very different. I think you know his father Hafez was a brutal man, um, Hama massacre, um, so on, and, and um, but uh, and, and diplomats that have dealt with him, dealt with Hafez, brought this up time and time again. Uh, when you um, diplomatically dealt with Hafez, he would very seldomly say yes, but when he did, he would follow through on it. Now Jordanians might feel a little differently about that, but. It was a little easier to deal with. Bashar is a, has been from the beginning a Janus-faced man. Mm -hmm. uh, he will tell you whatever you want to hear in a meeting and then walk out of it and do exactly the opposite. Um, talk about peace with Israel, um, with the Obama administration that really wanted an agreement, and then a couple of days later, uh, move a couple of Scud missiles over the uh, right. Jordanian, uh, over the um, Lebanese frontier. You know, how do you balance that out? And the fact of the matter is, Bashar doesn't add up. He never did add up, and he's not going to add up. Um, and the only way that you can get him to add up in a political and a military sense is to put him into hard dilemmas, diplomatic, political, and military. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the butcher was easier to deal with than the son? I think he, d he came out of, he built the regime, mm -hmm. he came out of a different environment, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the son is far harder to deal with, um, and the nature of the regime has substantially changed under the, during the course of the war, mm -hmm. which will make dealing with him, I think, that much harder and, 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 and complicated. And, and that's where both the neighbors come in mm -hmm. and then the region as a whole comes in. Uh, let's jump ahead to something a little more current. Uh, Representative Hartman, uh, you have long been a critic of Vladimir Putin. I think you wrote once that he was delusional, messianic, narcissistic, yeah. moralistic, and brutal. I don't... <laughs> Uh, I think you agreed sure with somebody that. else's quote, yes. Uh, um, it was in the yeah, New I don't think that was my quote. But now, anyway. so in addition to uh, invading Ukraine and uh, backing Assad, we think that he meddled with our election. Um, is it simply misguided and morally reprehensible to work on a deal with him, or do we have to look at the facts on the ground and be pragmatic? I think we should continue to talk to him. I, no, I, and, I, and I think we should look on the, at the facts on the ground. And I think where he has transgressed, he should be punished. And our policy sh should be crystal clear. Um, but where there are opportunities, and for example, there's an opportunity in the Arctic. I mean, people here understand climate and global warming has created a fourth ocean. I'm not kidding, an Arctic ocean 
which could become and is becoming the sea lane between Asia and Europe. It's a shorter passage than the Panama Canal. And there are huge issues around commerce, uh, tribal claims, uh, country claims, and security. And the Russians and we are two of uh, eight countries that border this region. And we are working together. So why shouldn't we do that? Uh, we should. And that's why uh, Lavrov and uh, Tillerson were together in Alaska a couple weeks ago talking about this. So build on what's positive, but don't uh, uh, blink on what's negative. And yes, they did hack into our election. And yes, they did circulate disinformation in a, in a very effective way uh, on the internet. And yes, they tried to hack into local election systems, which, by the way, are all, the, the good news is they're all over 10 years old, and it's impossible to really <laughs> penetrate. You, you wouldn't use a cell phone like that, so why do we use voting machines like that? But at any rate, um, they, they should be punished for that. They should be punished for the transgressions into Ukraine. Uh, nobody's talking about Crimea anymore. I think we should. And destabilizing the development of a pluralistic democratic regime in, regi in Ukraine, which has other issues. I mean, there's still massive corruption is not OK. So he needs to be confronted harshly about that. And there need to be penalties. Uh, Stuart, likewise, um, you have come out front for the government and accused Assad of using crematoria to uh, hide the evidence of his mass torture and murder. Um, how can we move ahead with a peace deal that would leave him in control of at least some part of the country? Um. That's right. We, we believe that, that the Bashar regime is using Sednaya prison to kill and then eliminate the remains of thousands, maybe mm. tens of thousands of victims of the, of the regime. It's a, it's a gruesome story. I just want to pick up on something Jane said. I think it's really important. So in Syria, the people who have influence inside Syria are Russia, Iran, the regime, ISIS. Hezbollah. And then, his, and then we can uh, add mm -hmm. Hezbollah. So, um, so of, that, of those five groups, Russia is the only one we can talk to. We're not going to talk to the regime. We're not going to talk to Hezbollah. We're not going to talk to the Iranians. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to engage someone. Mm -hmm. I think that what Secretary Tillerson has done, and through, also through this uh, ne negotiation that the Jordanians have helped engineer, is that it's put the uh, responsibility for maintaining the ceasefire on the uh, regime side and on the Iranian side squarely on the shoulders of the Russians. And so this is a test for their capability at a time when they are seeking legitimacy and seeking to come back into uh, a more workable arrangement with the United States because of all the other mistakes they've made. So I think this is, um, this is important. There's no sense, I think, that the United States envisions working with a Bashar regime at the end of a political process. In everything the president said, everything the secretary said, we, uh, they iterate, they repeat that we want to see Bashar go. What we realize is we need to go at this in steps. Uh, we need to defeat ISIS. We need to create uh, safe zones where people can return to life and possibly return to their homes, and then create a political process that ultimately will lead to the removal of Bashar al-Assad. But the, the key here, and this is something that the Europeans have really brought to the table is, you know. Syria, of course, is utterly destroyed by the, this war that's been dragging on for six years. No one, not us and not the Europeans and nobody else, not the Arabs, are going to go in and help Syria rebuild in cooperation with the Bashar regime. So, and the, uh, the Russians recognize that, and they need to see a restored Syria because they don't want to have to deal with uh, the next wave of uh, ISIS or, or whatever son of ISIS is. The Iranians, of course, less concerned about reconstruction Syria. They have sort of their own hegemonic objectives that are, are less concerned with the, the lives of individual people. So, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel uh, has come out against the ceasefire because he thinks it'll do exactly that. He thinks it will allow Iran and Hezbollah to entrench their position in southern Syria. Um, Jordan, obviously, is in favor of it. Why do you disagree with the Israelis? We do not disagree with the Israelis at all. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that um, they, I mean, on this issue, everybody knows that having a Nusra on, on in the northern border or having Hezbollah 
or anybody else is not uh, good news. And just to get back to the older mm -hmm. story, you say, your, your first question was, why talk to the Russians? Is it a good idea? My question is, you don't want to talk to the Russians, but you don't want to go into a war, and you don't want to commit boots on the ground. What do you want? What, what is the alternative? I mean, this is very funny that in modern time, if you consider Russia to be the enemy, you don't want to talk to it. And that's very modern theory of politics. I mean, if you look at World War I and World War II, everybody was talking to, with everybody. Nowadays, nobody wanna, wants to talk to the enemy. Right. Who do you want to talk to? No, honestly, who do you want to talk to? Do you think it's easy? Everybody forgets, uh, forgets what the, the pressure is on Jordan. And, and this war has been a, uh, an awful <coughs> thing on us. Not only do we have 1.4 uh, million refugees, mm -hmm. which is more than what you get a year in the United States as legitimate m immigrants and refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 20% of our population. Mm -hmm. It has been a stress on our economy, it has been a stress on our system, it has been a stress on every possible way. Plus, we're in the coalition, we're, anti we're fighting anti-ISIS. We have the Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem. Uh, our borders with Iraq are still closed. We have no uh, economic uh, venue towards Syria, we have, everything has stopped. And then you say, we don't want to talk to the Russians. The only person that can have a certain influence on on the government in Syria and try to move things uh, forward and be a guarantee for some sort of stability is the Russians. And we have kept open channels with them all throughout because there is no other. And another thing I want to say that I keep hearing in the press saying that the actual president has decided to quit the idea of, of asking the uh, Syrian president to go. This has been going on for three years, by the way, except that now uh, they talk about it. For three years in the council, when I was presiding and when I was in the, sitting on the council, many of these issues were already, but everybody decided not to, it's the one thing that we don't say. So um, there are lots of things that are uh, repeated, but that are not correct. And so it's very important to know that there is no issue out of this war without the Russians being guaranteed that the, um, uh, military boots that are uh, with Iran are on our borders, mm -hmm. and the same with Hezbollah. And that this is the only the only way to get out of it. And if the Israelis make statements, it's fine. But they they also are worried about uh, the same, you know, uh, ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and the Golan Heights everywhere. So statements are one thing, but what's uh, is another. Um. So this is a situation where victory actually might bring even more confusion. Um, that is, if we drive ISIS out of its self-proclaimed capital, um, it, much of its leadership will live on, its fighters will live on, its hateful ideology will live on. You mean for whom? For, the, for which part? If, if we get rid of ISIS, you're worried who would... No, I mean, they, they are, you're not going to kill every member of ISIS, right? There's, no. This is going to create, a, they're going to have to go somewhere. Um, what sort of... Well, because, uh, t just give me one second on sure. ISIS. I mean, obviously, we, we are very much involved in the fight against ISIS. And, and you know, His Majesty keeps saying fighting ISIS is, is there's the short term, the middle term, and the long term. And the short term is militarily, which is, which is what we're seeing mm -hmm. going on, the fight. And there's a security aspect that goes on, that's the midterm, but the long term is changing the minds and the culture of people and making them understand and the messaging and going out and explaining the youth that it's not useful for them to join ISIS, that there are better ways of, of leading their lives, that we have to give them opportunities, economic. I wish we would spend like 5% of what we're spending on armaments in the Middle East. Mm -hmm on development, on an economic issues. I wish, because then we'd be in better, but it's not the case, unfortunately. All the money is going into armaments because we're fighting all these things. So um, this, this is very important. Now, concerning Syria, if you get rid of ISIS, they're gonna go elsewhere. A part of them will, will convert back to normality, quote unquote. Right. But there will always be a section of people, and that's the worry that we have. And that's part of the program that uh, Secretary Kelly was referring to yesterday, in which we're saying we need to have all the uh, agencies cooperate together throughout the world. Right. You know, be it the intelligence, be it the security, 
to know what is going on and to know that these fighters, the foreign fighter syndrome is everywhere. When, if they were to leave Syria, where would they go? There's Africa, there's Asia, you know, Europe, of course. So all these are questions that have to be dealt with on a global level. Uh, Andrew, we, um, no matter what happens, a settlement with the Russians to sort of stabilize the country, um, we will have to stand up for the rebel troops that we've been supporting. Um, yet we don't know a lot about many of them. How do we go about vetting them to figure out that they are good rebels um, and people that we can continue to, uh, to hope have a role? in Syria? Yeah, it, it's an excellent question. So um, uh, allegedly, uh, the United States has a covert program uh, in Syria that it's um, allegedly going to wind down. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to shake out, but mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a mystery to all of you. It's been widely reported and yesterday reported um, in the Washington Post. Uh, that program um, has, um, uh, has reported uh, based out of two centers, one in Jordan, called the Mok, and the mm -hmm. one in um, Turkey called the Mom, uh, but they're essentially military operation centers uh, that, um, uh, that help deal with the rebels. So what it's, what it's done over time is it's uh, in, with very limited covert support uh, propped up a number of groups, uh, primarily localized, non-ideological groups that are fighting against the Assad regime. Right. Um, now, um, the, the, that has not been a successful strategy in a number of ways. Um, one of them is the nature of a covert program lacks political coherence, so it's very difficult to get those who, people who are legitimately involved in a revolution at the beginning of the conflict focused politically um, and uh, in a different direction. Um, and then the second thing, of course, was, and this is, you know, talk about the red line being a disastrous decision of Obama, I would, I would beg to differ. I think the most disastrous decision of President Obama um, occurred in the summer of 2012 when he did two things, not just one. One was to n not back the moderate rebels uh, and help mm -hmm. organize them and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was one thing. But he, the second step, and often not talked about, is he allowed our regional allies to do so on our behalf. And I'm not talking about present company here. I'm talking about others. And folks, uh, it, it takes a lot of gall to, uh, to, to, to say to people, well, you go ahead and support the rebels, but you have to do it on our terms. Right. And they didn't do it on our terms because they look at the rebels differently. So it should be no um, surprise to all of you that Salafists mm -hmm. grew up among the rebels, many of whom were actually localized and legitimately fighting against the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question is, what do you do from here? Um, well, even if you supposedly wind down a program that's targeted against overthrowing the Assad regime, which has not been successful until now. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't be replaced with something else, and also something to defend some of these zones. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, in the end, we are in a tricky situation. We need not only a settlement in Syria. This is not about democracy, folks. This is about a settlement that allows refugees to go home into places where they're safe. And if things continue on the path they're going now, with the Assad regime backed up by Shia militia all over the country, um, spreading out and so on, refugees are not going to go home. Right. Yeah. And most refugees that have gone home to date, uh, there was the, the regime put out a statement the other day backed up by the UN that 500,000 refugees had, had gone back to their homes, but actually if you look closer, uh, 440,000 of them are internally displaced persons who are already under the control of the regime, yeah. and another 50,000 or so are actually refugees from neighboring countries. So we need a sustainable settlement, we need to prop up these de-escalated zones, um, and we need to work towards that settlement where we have a, a coherent Syria with Assad out of power so that we can I improve governance there and allow people to go back home. And, it, and it's, it's a tall order and probably lifetime employment for many people up here on stage. Yeah. So you think that the decision, if true, to defund this covert program that I'm sure Stuart will neither <laughs> confirm nor deny, um, needed replacing anyway? I think, I think it, it, it probably needed tweaked, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's probably what's going to happen um, mm -hmm. uh, because it begs the, begs the question, so if we're going to have these de-escalation zones and things with the Russians are so tricky, what are we going to do when folks that we're trying to support in these areas, mm -hmm. people who have returned home, come under fire from Iranian militia? Right. Back right. Militia. Lebanese Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 these are not Assad regime. One of the biggest changes in Syria yeah. is the Assad regime is not like it was the one I lived under. Right. It is completely changed. Uh, it, at its core, we know some of the main players, but 
uh, the Assad regime, because of its political decisions and its decisions to shoot its way out of the uprising, um, have um, completely decimated military recruitment. Mm -hmm. And then that has allowed uh, an unbelievable number, uh, uh, tens of thousands, of Iranian-backed militia to come into Syria to support the regime. And uh, that is a big concern. I mean, that's the giant elephant in the room. I think these folks over here were polite about it. But you know, there's ISIS, and then there's what comes after ISIS. And that's legitimately, I think, scaring a lot of neighbors, uh, Israel, Jordan, and others. And um, that's why these de-escalation zones are very important at this point. Yeah, if, if I Please. could just add to that. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm totally sympathetic to what Dina just said. Um, 1.4 million people in a population the size of Jordan's is totally destabilizing. And Jordan has stepped up, you know, way, punched way above its weight. And the, His Majesty continues to do that. And he's an enormously astute analyst of what's going on. And that's one point. Second point is there are four wars in Syria, not one war. There's the civil war. There's the Kurdish-Turkish war. There's the global proxy war. Um, that's Russia and we and Iran and others. You know, Not that we're in it, uh, because we seem to be packing out of it. But at any rate, we let Russia into it uh, by the deal that Obama and the UN made, in my view, to let Russia preside over the dismantling of chemical weapons. Uh, and that gave Russia purchase that it didn't have before. So there's that war. And then there's the Sunni-Shia war. And you know the Alawis, which uh, Bashar is an Alawi, are, I think, 11% of the population. Right. And they are Shia, but it's a majority Sunni country. So it's a catastrophe. And our failure to intervene in smarter ways earlier has cost us dearly. Anybody remember safe zones? That was a really good idea, I think. And a lot of Obama's advisors, including Dave Petraeus and Hillary Clinton and others, said, do it, do it. And he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And now I don't know how you could do it. And so many of the neighborhoods that would have been protected are gone. So just my, my last comment is, it's kind of nice to talk about people coming home. Coming home to what? Yeah. Uh, these, these places are leveled. Where are they, what are they coming home to? And if there won't be investment in rebuilding, which probably there won't be, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. So i just like to pick up Please. on something, because of course that's a very important point. So one of the things that we can do once these areas get stabilized is provide stabilization assistance. You know, in, in Iraq, the UNDP working with uh, the US Embassy has hit on a dramatic new formula for stabilization that, you know, working with local governments inserts, you know, resources to restore lights, electricity, water, et cetera. I mean, it's a modest program, but you can get people back, in, you know, back to work and back to life. Um, and we have resources to, for that. What we won't do, of course, is the next step of reconstruction, because right. that would require uh, a broader cooperation with the Assad regime. But I think ev everything that Jane is saying is, is exactly right. Uh, on this uh, issue of the um, de-escalation zones, I mean, again, what we're, what's going to have to happen is that the Russians are going to have to police this, and there's going to have to be a monitoring program. What Andrew said is right. I mean, we don't have control over these opposition groups. Um, some of them are extremists who we would never have control over under any circumstances. If they provoke the regime and then the regime retaliates and then there's civilian casualties, how does that, you know, even though that's a violation of Security Council resolutions, the Russians are going to say, well, this was provoked by the, uh, by the opposition. So we need a monitoring regime that will allow us to police these uh, ceasefire lines and give people stability in their lives. And they're working on that in Jordan now, for having the monitoring mechanism that is, at least for that zone that started. Okay. Because the important for this zone to succeed is that it will probably be something to emulate in other areas in Syria. Right. Uh, Stuart, Jane brought up the Turks and the Kurds. The Kurds have been in many people's minds our best fighting allies, in, both in, uh, in, in Iraq and Syria. Um, we would love to stand by them, I think. Uh, the Turks will not be pleased about that. Even a de facto independent Kurdistan would be a huge problem for them. Then again, over the last couple of years, the Turks have kind of shifted from loyal NATO ally, ally to frenemy in some ways. Um, is there any way we can carve out a peace between them? So. I think uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis has been very eloquent on this. I mean, our partnership with Turkey is uh, one of the you know, pillars of our uh, 
security arrangements around the world. We want to continue to partner with the Turks. Um, the, clearly, the Turks have been uncomfortable with the support that we have provided to the Syrian Democratic Forces, which have had tremendous success in defeating ISIS. But it's very important that whatever we do in northeastern Syria not create a political monopoly for any Kurdish movement or Kurdish uh, uh, political party, and that the, uh, and so that a range of views can emerge in that setting that will be, you know, welcome not only to people who are living there, but also not feel, be threatening uh, to Turkey. So I think we can play a positive role by uh, providing some stabilization, but not providing so much stabilization or reconstruction that we create winners on the ground who are, will then, you know, sort of uh, run the table in terms of establishing political primacy. And so we're talking to the Turks about this constantly. They're watching it uh, with great concern. But the fact is, is that, you know, Raqqa is now going to fall. This key element of the caliphate is going to collapse. And that's largely due to the Syrian Democratic Forces and the U.S. support. Yeah. Um. We, uh, we talked a little bit about Iran before. There's many people who feel that um, the Iranian backing and of, of Hezbollah and taking large parts of Syria, that they're trying to create this Shiite crescent that will go all the way from Tehran to the, Mediter to the Mediterranean. Uh, is that a real concern, and what do we do about it? Um, well, one thing I should have said at the beginning when I talked about our uh, serious strategy is in addition to defeating ISIS and creating safe zones and um, working towards political process is to make sure that our partners in the region, namely Jordan, Israel, Turkey, that, you know, that their security is enhanced. And Jane's comments about what the Jordanians have done is, is really important. And I think we can't give King Abdullah enough credit for his leadership. I mean, think about the challenges that that country has faced and how he's brought them through this. So, um, so clearly, an Iranian crescent, uh, you know, sort of bolstered by Hezbollah, does represent a threat to our key partners in the region. And that is something we need to be very concerned about. Um, we need to, and we need to look at ways that we can do that. Obviously, we need to defeat ISIS. We need to bolster communities. When you have, um, communities that are coming back to life in Syria and in Iraq, because of course Iraq is part of that crescent too, those communities in that path are not going to welcome an Iranian crescent. Mm -hmm. So if we can bolster those communities, I think that's the, that's the best way forward. Um, and yet those communities and uh, our allies now have a schism between them, and that's the isolation of Qatar by uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, UAE, et cetera. How big of a blow is that to the, uh, the solidity of the uh, anti-terrorism bloc? I think that um, the, the Riyadh summit that the president um, joined and led uh, back in May was a crucial step in bringing together not just the Arab world, but the Islamic world to condemn extremism, to um, cooperate on um, their, our mutual security in the Gulf, to blunt the malign interference of Iran and its proxies in the region. And, you know, obviously the, um, the problems between Qatar and the other GCC partners is not helpful. That's a distraction. That's what Secretary Tillerson has said. But I, I, I think that the power of the, the statements that came out of the Riyadh summit uh, are, create a basis to move forward in a way that ensures that we do get regional cooperation on these issues. And now Secretary Tillerson is working very hard to find a way to bind up the uh, um, the schism that has uh, emerged in the GCC, and I, I will hope that he'll be able to do that very soon. Could I just comment on that? I think President Trump's trip there was a real plus mm -hmm. and, and shows real promise. And the Qataris were in the meeting. Uh, and so uh, all this kerfluffle later seemed a little uh, excessive. And now I gather that the demands have, have been reduced. Maybe that's Tillerson's influence or maybe something about fake news and uh, they've uh, pulled back, so that's good news. But what I wanted to raise was, reading in the failing New York Times yesterday or the day before, I read about this coup, or it could be called a coup, in Saudi Arabia uh, by the young prince, who now is, is the crown prince. And I don't know if those facts are totally accurate, but it is a little scary to contemplate uh, Saudi Arabia all of a sudden becoming possibly 
uh, destabilized and unrest in Saudi Arabia itself, and that does blow back to all this. Uh, we'll have to go to audience questions in just a minute, uh, but one last question for Andrew. You just edited a volume uh, of essays on the 100th anniversary of Sykes-Picot, or almost 100th anniversary. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what mistakes were made a century ago when, <laughs> when, when the West divided up the Middle East, and is there any lesson that we can learn? Well, we, <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, before everybody starts trolling me on Twitter, uh, <laughs> for, I mean, I, I think a couple of things. One is, you know, the, the boundaries of the Middle East have been, we, we found, have been um, uh, re resilient. I mean, yeah. there have been some changes. There have been some wars, of course. Um, I think what's, uh, what, what made this particularly uh, sensitive was the breakdown of Iraq and Syria mm -hmm. and, and the questions uh, that it raised. Uh, in the end, we found that um, it's, it wasn't so much the lines. There was that involvement. There was an anti-colonial uh, feeling, which I think was legitimate. Um, but in the end, the, the answer to Middle Easterners uh, living better lives and to us leaving the region in peace, which we have every interest in doing and we're not doing, um, uh, is better governance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take some hard choices from people that live in the region and, and from us and what we were able to do together. And we, so we, we looked at it as not just what happened, but what were, what were the successes, what were the drawbacks, and what should the U.S. do going forward? And, and governance, not necessarily democracy, but governance was very important um, and I think is key to settling Syria and Iraq as well. And okay. also the Israeli-Palestinian issue, which is lingering yes. yep. and which is very important um, stabilizer for the region. But I will not say more because I think the ambassador of Palestine is somewhere. It's his baby, so <laughs> he will talk about it. Yeah. Well, as we talk about good governance in the region, yeah. you guys are a great model for it. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to audience questions. Um, three rules. First is that wait for the microphone. Give us your name and your affiliation. Uh, second one is make sure that your question is a question. Uh, and third, try and keep it concise, to the point, short, uh, or as, to steal a line from my former colleague, Eric Schmidt, I will just have to interrupt you, which will only embarrass both of us. Go ahead, Josh. Thank you very much, Josh Rogan, Washington Post. Thank you all for your time and your service. Um, it seems to me, as I listen to this, that this entire Syria strategy, that this ceasefire can be built upon and replicated, is based on one big assumption. And that's that the other people on the other side of this negotiation see that the same way. But I would submit that there's mounting evidence that Russia, Iran, the regime, don't believe that this ceasefire is meant to be replicated to build similar ceasefires around the country. What we see is um, troops moving to new locations, that they're using this as an opportunity to take those resources to other fronts. Thousands of Iranian, Afghani, Iraqi, Shia militiamen pouring into Deir al-Zor, right? So we may have a temporary short-term benefit in the southwest of Syria at the cost of an increased escalation and disaster humanitarily, especially in north southeast Syria, maybe northwest Syria, you name it. So my question is, first of all, for Ambassador Jones, but for the panel more broadly, is what if, just hypothetically, the Russians and the Iranians don't agree that this is the best way to move forward, and, and actually they're planning for a huge escalation that will result in an expansion, a worsening of the war, a worsening of the... What's our plan? Do we have one? Thank you. So I think that's an excellent question, Josh, and thanks for asking, because I was gonna, I was gonna raise this. So, what we see now as a result of uh, our ceasefire in the Southwest and um, the Astana process's efforts to create these de-escalation zones is that this has freed pro-regime forces to move east to Deir Zor. But you know, what's interesting to me about this is that this is the first time in the duration of the war that the regime and pro-regime forces have shown any interest in defeating ISIS forces. And in fact, those, uh, you know, that's the target in Deir Zor. It's to, it's to both uh, rescue uh, the, the Syrian forces that are there that are surrounded by ISIS and also to defeat ISIS in that vicinity. Now, we'll see how they do. We'll see, we'll see if they're effective. Um, but that would be overall useful to the counter-ISIS campaign since coming for, much further south from Raqqa poses challenges for the U.S.-supported uh, forces. Um, but I think the other part of your question is also equally important because once that is done, what, what do those pro-regime forces do? Do they come back and then try to pick off uh, the opposition each de-escalation de zone, and then they have the benefit of not having to cover the other zones 
Um, th that's, a, that's a concern. And that's why I think uh, Secretary Tillerson has put uh, the onus of these de-escalation zones squarely on the shoulders of the Russians. This is a real test of Russia's ability to lead this, this process. And you asked about the Astana process earlier. And you know, it is true that there has been a reduction of violence since the May announcement. That, but then in the most recent meeting, the Iranians and the Turks couldn't agree on the arrangements surrounding these de-escalation zones. So the, the last meeting of the Astana process was not fruitful, and which goes to your, your point. The solution uh, is, is to put this on, on the Russians. And if, if that fails, it's a problem. There's not one good uh, decision. There's only the least bad in, in the Syrian. Um, no, it's true. I mean, every, every decision that's made is what can we do that's less harmful? We know it's very complicated. We're about to get a hard hook. So one more question. Uh, gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Elmer Tivison, a terrorism analyst for ZDF German TV. Uh, I, I want to add one aspect to the whole mess that we see there, of course which is that the King of Jordan at the Munich Security Conference last year uh, issued a very dire warning. He basically said that we won't defeat ISIS if we don't address and fight also the ideology that is behind it, that is creating the fertile ground also and the justification for violence. And he named the ideology. He said it's the Wahhabi strain of Islam which is spread, and he named, for example, the problem of the Balkans, where there are mosques and, and the ideology supported and financed by Saudi Arabia in the Balkans, and we see similar things in some, other, in some North African countries as well. So my question would be to Stuart, of course. Stuart, given the closeness of uh, the US with Saudi Arabia that was on display during the visit of the president in Saudi Arabia, given the fact that the economic dependence might be even increasing by asking Saudi Arabia to, for huge investments into the US society and the US system. How do you muster the leverage to tell the Saudis to stop the spreading of this Wahhabi strain throughout the world? So I, again, I want to come back to what Jane said about the Riyadh summit. I mean, this is the focus of the bilateral component and then the GCC component of, of the summit, which was that the, the, all of us in, who participated in that summit committed to not support extremism abroad to, and to reduce the efforts of people in, in the countries who live there to, to diminish their efforts to support extremism abroad. So one of these signal deliverables of the summit was the establishment of the Etilal Center Against Extremism, which is based in Riyadh. And this is uh, a joint center. This is not just a a Saudi center, it's a joint center, we're going to have three members on the board. These are going to be high-level board members. Uh, uh, Prince um, Mohammed bin Salman uh, himself has appointed himself to the board. Mm. Uh, the uh, senior uh, Emiratis are also going to participate. And this center, focusing now on media, but the idea is to expand to reduce the export of extremism from the region. And this is something, again, in the, in the GCC documents, you'll see that there are real, there's a real commitment to address this issue. And one of the things that Secretary Tillerson added at the last minute of the GCC summit was an agreement to come back in 12 months and see how we're doing on this, um, you know, on this agenda. So you're right that it is a, it is a problem, but we've got a commitment from, uh, from uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia to, to follow through on, on this issue. May I, may I just answer because you quoted my king. I know, he quoted my king. I cannot stop this without answering. <laughs> um, <laughs> very sensitive issue. No, His Majesty was talking about the ideology. Uh, from your question, you, ref you make it sound like he was accusing the uh, Saudi government. So I'd just like to correct that. We're always talking about the ideology and we're working uh, with, the, with the Gulf states and all the Arab countries to fight this ideology because it's affecting them as much as affecting all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you. A round of applause for uh, the panelists. Okay, that was, that was very good.